Welcome. I'm John Olson, one of the pastors on staff at VEF, and we're glad that you're joining us today for our worship service. We're still not able to meet in person, but we're glad that you're joining us online, and hopefully we'll be able to gather and be one again soon. So let's begin with a call to worship from Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You know, Heavenly Father, as we come here today, Lord, we are here to worship you, to glorify your name. And so we just want to turn our attention to you now and acknowledge that you are God because of you. We can have peace. We can have life. And we thank you for that. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. have a word of prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you today, and we bow down. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy, for your grace for us, 
You know, Lord, we are living in uncertain times. We are living in a place and a time where we don't know what the future holds. You know, we don't know when restrictions might be lifted. We don't know what long-term effects are going to be. And God, we just put our faith and our trust in you. You know, and in the midst of this, we know that there are people who are sick, who are ill, Lord, and we just ask that you would heal them. You know, we lift them up to you, asking that you would you know, heal them, give them strength. May they recover from their illnesses. We know that sickness and death is not your plan, but it came into the world because of sin, because of disobedience to you. And so, God, we look forward to the restoration where one day we will have perfect health, perfect bodies. We know that in this time there are people who are lonely, people who are, are suffering, God, and we just ask that you would give them peace, give them comfort. You know, may we all be reaching out to our friends, our neighbors, encouraging each other, that we might lift each other up, that we'd be praying for one another. And so, God, we just pray these things in your name. Amen. You know, we haven't been able to meet for a while, but one of the things that we do regularly at the church is we will confess the Christian faith with the Lord's, with the Apostles' Creed. You know, the Apostles' Creed is a summary of doctrines of the Bible. And even though we're not able to meet together in B1 to be saying this, I encourage you right now, let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. Let's confess the Christian faith as summarized. So let's go ahead and say this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd just like to have a, a time of silent prayer now. So I encourage you, wherever you are, whether you're out somewhere watching this or you're at home, let's have a, a moment of silent prayer together. So let's, let's pray and go to God right now. Now, Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we know that you hear our prayers. We can be confident of that. You are a living God, not made of stone, not made of wood, but you hear us. And Lord, I also ask that as we pray to you, you know, we would be in your will. Lord, we have many wants and desires, sometimes things that aren't good for us. And Lord, I just ask that all of us would be in your will. And as you answer our prayers, just give us the ability, give us the strength to accept your answers, to accept your timing, Lord. So again, we just thank you for your goodness and mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We believe VBS Vacation Bible School 
it's really important for kids growth in God. That's why we will still do the VBS this year, but of course online. Please welcome David, who is in charge of it, with Dora, and hear the details of VBS. Hey guys, it's summer 2021 and it's time for this year's VBS. Now, just because things are moving online doesn't mean that we can't have any less fun. Last year we had the fruit of the spirit and this year we're covering the armor of God. Now, you remember it has the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of the gospel of peace, and the, and the sword of the spirit, okay? Now guys, just like before, there's always games, there's snacks, there's crafts, there's Bible readings, there's songs, everything that we like to have for VBS, okay? Um, remember to sign your kids up before July 31st, and you can sign your kids up looking at the Google documents directly below this video, or I'm assuming Jim's will probably attach it to the video. Um, yeah, so it will be August 5, August 6, and August 7th from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, same as any other year. Hope to see you guys there. It'll be fun just like always, and just because it's online doesn't mean that we can't learn and have fun like we did before. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. As most of you know, Pastor John Olsen's family is going back to America on 20th this month. That's why we want to express our gratitude for their amazing work here in VF for 10 years. We will put a box this week in the church lobby and you can put a card or cash gifts for Olsen's. The box will be there from this Thursday to Saturday from 10 in the morning to 8 in the evening. Yesterday, we had a baptism ceremony and I felt sorry that most of you guys couldn't be a witness on site. But thank God, we still have this technology to show you the ceremony now. Before we start, since this is our first time, let's just have a, a word of prayer as well. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather here to celebrate. Uh, we'd much rather be in a, a room with a lot of people, but Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Nevertheless, thank you for Jeffrey, for his life. This is exciting. Uh, as we do this, just make sure, Lord, we'd ask that there's no technical difficulties, but just let us celebrate and rejoice on you know, the new addition to your family. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, Jeffrey... You know, we're, we're here today to, to celebrate. We, you know, we are glad for your desire to be baptized. And you know, let's read a scr few scripture verses about our need for baptism. You know, from 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4 and Romans 6, 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Or do, don't you know that for all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You know, Jeffrey, you know, you have declared your desire to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you now reaffirm this desire to be baptized? Yes. And so with the whole church joining us, thank you. You know, we, we celebrate and rejoice with you in your desire to be baptized. So let's hear the commandment of Jesus to be baptized from Matthew 28. 18 to 20, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
And right now, I would like us together to confess the Christian faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, this is a summary of the Christian faith, said, recited for almost two millennia. So let's say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. There he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You know, Jeffrey, again, we celebrate and rejoice. And I just ask you now, will you be baptized into this Christian faith? Yes. You know, so Jeffrey, you just please lean forward a little bit. You know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to give you that. And let us pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us. You are Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, Jeffrey, the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. So let's take a moment and, and pray for you, Jeffrey. Pray for your life. You know, Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up Jeffrey to you. Lord, I, I thank you for him. He is your child. You have created him. He is precious and valuable in your sight. And I thank you for the work that you have done in his life. I thank you for each person here and their friendship and the influence they have had on him. And we just ask that Jeffrey would continue to grow in grace, in truth, in the knowledge of your love. May he experience it and ex just be filled with it. Uh, watch over his family here. Thank you for his mother that she is able to be here today. Lord, and just you know, continue to work in their lives. Thank you so much. And today we just want to celebrate and rejoice. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Baptism is a wonderful thing. If you'd like to be baptized, I encourage you to talk to myself, to talk to Pastor Tom or Jim's. All right, thank you for joining us today. All right, thank you, guys. Hi there, guys. John here. Uh, I'm just going to share a passage with you that um, I find meaningful and uh, encouraging. And uh, it's from Psalm 139. Let me just read it to you. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Shoal, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, 
Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. Um, I find this passage a, a great encouragement and uh, even a great comfort. Um, nothing has happened today, nothing will happen tomorrow. Uh, indeed, nothing will even happen at any point in the future that uh, will take God by surprise. Um, we can't hide from Him. You can't hide things from Him. Uh, he sees, He knows everything, He even knows our thoughts. Uh, in verse 2, it says that He discerns our thoughts from afar. And verse 4 says that He knows what we're going to say before we speak. Um, but God isn't a stalker, He isn't following us around. He's not watching us like sting, you know, every step you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. No, we, we read in verse 13 that, that God made us. He knitted us together in our mother's womb, you know, it's so right down to the amino acids in our DNA. Uh, the language here isn't that of, uh, of a creepy stalker. Uh, it's more that of a loving father. If, uh, if you look at verse 5, you hem me in behind and before. This is the language uh, of sort of tucking a baby into bed so that it can't fall out of its crib. So uh, as, we, as we go about our lives, as, uh, as typically we worry about the future, the, the fact is that we don't need to worry. God's got this. God's in control. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows what uh, President Tsai or President Biden or even President Xi is going to do. Um, if I have to give you another passage to back that up, it would be uh, Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So uh, some of you, maybe you're worrying about your job, maybe you're worrying about your family, your finances, your health. Uh, God's in control of all of this. We, we don't understand God because we're not God, but we can trust him. He's got this. Have a good week, guys. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are doing well and healthy. Um, I was asked to share what God has been teaching me these past few weeks. And uh, not long ago, a VEF member, Irene, asked me to read the Bible story together for her daughter and my daughter uh, using online meeting and I tried the online meeting uh, reading the Bible story that we have been receiving in our Sunday school materials through emails and uh, we share the Bible story together we ask the children to read together and we were very blessed by it and uh, not long after that the language school where I work at asked the teachers to uh, start online meeting as well. So I feel that God has helped uh, and then uh, open an opportunity for me to learn a new skill and not only for my work but as well as for the Sunday school in VEF. So uh, because we may be not able to meet soon uh, so the teachers are slowly getting more equipped with the online meeting skill so we can reach out to our Sunday school students. We still can see them through online and talk to them, keep in touch and read the Bible story and Bible verse together. So I'm going to close my sharing with the Bible verse, Romans 8:28, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. I'm so glad that I can share uh, what God has been teaching me these few weeks. I hope to hear uh, more uh, at another Sunday. We, I, and I hope you are all doing well too at home. Thank you. God bless you. Ezekiel 2, verse 1 to 5. 
And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are also impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 9 But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I am Pastor Tom Curry. Good to be here with you again today, even though I'm looking forward <laughs> to actually being with you live and in person. And as, as Ron and I shared on our YouTube daily devotions, for our first service, when we come back together, we're going to serve the bread and the cup. I miss that. I don't know if you miss it as much as I do. Uh, in my home church in the U.S., we actually would share that every Sunday, and it just had so much meaning. But anyway, so uh, I'm looking forward to that time. Uh, it may not be until August. It may be in a couple of weeks. We're not sure. And I certainly... Um, and Ron and I are keeping Pastor John and Kirsty and their family in prayer as they prepare to leave and bring closure in saying goodbyes to everyone. Today, I would, would like to speak to you from the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 6. We've been in the Gospel of Mark for several weeks, and we still we will be in the Gospel of Mark for several weeks more. But today, chapter 6, uh, verses 7 through 13, is an event. It's not, it's not a parable, uh, but it's Jesus instructing his disciples. And I think it gives us tremendous insight as to our purpose in life, as to the role of the church. I don't know about you, but I've heard the question a lot of times over the years, why am I here? Why am I here? I never will forget in my first church an elderly man visiting with him in a nursing care facility. His wife was gone. All of his friends were, were gone. He showed me a picture of his grades one through six school photo. And he says, you see all of these children here? You see this one on the front row? That's me. I'm the only one left. They're, all of these others are gone. And I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm last. So whether you're 80 years old and you're wondering that, or whether you're 15 years old, or 20 years old, or 25 years old, and you're wondering, you know, what is it all about, really? Is it just 
making a salary and having a house and going through the motions. Now, why am I here really? What is that overarching grand purpose? And I think we would all agree that the Great Commission speaks volumes to us. We have the Great Commission of the Old Testament in Genesis 12, where God tells Abraham to go and leave your country and leave your father's house and your family and your relatives and go to a foreign land, uh, and I will bless all the nations of the earth. We have a very similar statement, Jesus' last statement, uh, saying, go into all the world and make disciples. And so we view those as the Great Commission of the Old Testament, Genesis 12, the Great Commission of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28. And those really do, there is a lot there as to, all right, collectively, why are we here really? As the body of Christ, if each individual Christian is a member of the actual body of Christ on this earth, like we say and believe, then collectively, collectively, we have this incredible purpose. And this text speaks to that purpose. Mark says, And Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals, not put on two tunics. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil, many who were sick and healed them. Let us pray. Lord, every Sunday we begin by just opening this ancient book, looking at these ancient words, that by your power you have preserved these words, Lord. They've, they've not changed over the years. You have preserved them. You have inspired them. They are true. They're the foundation stones that we can build our life upon. So, Heavenly Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak to everyone viewing this service, regardless of where they are, what situation in life they might be, that you would use your ancient words from Mark chapter 6 to ring true to their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today's message sent <coughs> into the world for a purpose. <coughs> Excuse me. Sent into the world <clears throat> for a distinct purpose. And as we look to this text once again and, be and begin to kind of dust it off and ponder it, think a little bit more deeply about it, I want you to take note just as how the whole thing begins. And he called the twelve. And so <clears throat> the emphasis is upon those 12 apostles, right? Those 12 apostles. Not any of them were perfect. One of them was actually a traitor. And Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth. And they were ordinary men. Ordinary men who had, your, who had their share of problems. Granted, I don't think they were bad men as far as being immoral men. They probably were basically moral. But you and I know. They had their share of weaknesses and problems. But yet Jesus chose them and he sent them out. Later on in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72. And my guess is, friends, they were ordinary people, ordinary men and women who had their share of anxiety moments and worries and all these kind of things and probably had their insecurities and weak moments and all those kind of things. But Jesus, he just sent them out. He chose them and he, he entrusted them with the gospel. And he sent them out. The day of Pentecost, over 3,000, the birth of the church, were baptized. They repented. 
The Holy Spirit came. They began to share life together. They didn't go off separately like loners, right? They shared life together. They shared their meals together. They were sharing everything together, really. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 6, we learned that, that some of the widows, they, some of the people, they felt like they were being left out of these common meals. And so they, they chose responsible men to take care of this main uh, uh, responsibility of feeding the, win the widows so the apostles could concentrate on ministry and prayer, keeping the main thing the main thing. I come from a country where a great value is put on individual thinking. Individual thinking and individual acting. We don't consult our parents over what our careers are going to be like they would in other parts of the country. We don't bring our parents in their elderly years, most of us in the U.S., we don't bring them into our homes. We take them to a nursing home because that's their life. We have our own lives. We don't consult our parents in our teen years if we're going to get a motorcycle or all of those kind of things. We're not as family focused in the U.S. We put a great amount of value on individual thinking, individualism. And there's some great things about that, but there's some great weaknesses also. And certainly when it comes to the Christian faith, there are glaring weaknesses, friends. Because when you become a person of faith, you're brought into the body of Christ. Baptism is a huge thing as far as identifying with the body of Christ. Collectively, you become a part of a whole great family that's been in existence throughout 2,000 years and is in every continent, on every continent in this world today. And it's no longer just an individual me and Jesus kind of thing, friends. Years ago, gospel uh, country western singer Tom T. Hall. Years ago, I used to enjoy listening to country western music. Don't make fun of me. <laughs> I like some of those songs. Anyway, Tom T. Hall sang a song about me and Jesus. And I really get it that, you know, it's He's singing about Jesus, and he's singing about individual faith. So it's like, come on, Curry, don't be too hard on Tom T. Hall. <laughs> and I can remember singing that song and really enjoying it because it put the emphasis upon the, the intimacy with God that is really, really possible. But some of the words in that song are kind of troubling. It goes like this. Well, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. We don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. I know a man who was once a sinner. I know a man that was once a drunk. I know a man who was once a loser. But he went out one day and made an altar out of a stump. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. We don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. Can't afford any fancy preaching. Can't afford any fancy church. Can't afford any fancy singing. But you know, Jesus got a lot of poor people out doing his work. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Don't need anybody to tell us what, it all, what it's all about. I get that. You know, it is precious, this me and Jesus, this knowing God. It's about knowing God, isn't it? It's not a religion. It's a relationship. I get that. I get that. I understand that. But yet, when you look at the lyrics of this song, friend, it's pretty troubling. It's like, I don't need anybody else. Don't need the family of God. 
Don't need the church. I can just go out in the woods, build an altar out of a stump. Don't need fancy preaching. Don't need fancy singing. I don't need, it's in essence saying, I don't need the church. Don't need organized Christianity. There's a lot of that thinking around, friends. There really is. And, and it's, like, it's like fingers to a chalkboard as to the word of God, as to what the Bible clearly teaches about the Christian life. Because it's not just about me and Jesus. Maybe it starts out like that. And in the infancy of one's faith, uh, it's like that. But true historical Christianity rooted in the ancient words of the Bible is that it's more than just me and Jesus. It's coming together with other people who are just like me, ordinary people, got their share of insecurities, got their share of phobias, got their share of problems. Sometimes we weasel out of things and we tell little white lies that we shouldn't, right? Sometimes we've acted in in moral ways even sometimes in life that brings shame upon us. We hang our head. We think, how can Jesus, you know, how can he die for me? I've got all these hang-ups or what. Whatever, ordinary people with warts, ordinary people with inconsistencies. Okay, we come together and somehow, somehow we work together. It's not just a matter of me and Jesus. So me and Pastor John over the past several months, you know, it's not recommended to do what VEF did by letting the senior pastor stay for six months as a new pastor comes on on board, that's not recommended. And it took a lot for Pastor John to support me, and it took a lot for me to work with Pastor John and appreciate what the Holy Spirit has done with this brother, how he has used Pastor John in the last 10 years in this church, and to respect that completely, it took a greater love that both of us have for the church. So we can put aside all our petty stuff, you know? So it's not just me and Jesus, it's me and Pastor John, it's me and Karesty and Rhonda and Jems and Vivian and Timothy and Beth. It's me and Cobus and me and Amanda, me and Edit, me and John, me and Amelia, me and Mary. It's, you know, it's, it's all of us together, friends. It's not just we got our own thing going. We don't need anybody. We need each other. That's the body of Christ, isn't it? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Isn't That what is in this verse when Jesus took the 12 and he sent them out and then he sent the 72 out. And when we look, when the church was born, they came together. They didn't go off as kind of like gospel mavericks. They came together and they worked together. I see that in this passage and it speaks to me. But let's go on. I just picked out a part of that first sentence. Let's go on. Let's finish that first sentence. He chose the twelve and began to send them out. To send them out, two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money, no belt. But to just wear sandals, not put on two tunics. You don't need to. You only need one. Sent them out just trusting God. Just trusting God. On an amazing mission. Sent the 72 out the same way. And when we look at the early church in the book of Acts, we find that they had their sleeves rolled up in kingdom work. They really did. Jesus said, We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. They understood that. They understood that. We have the book of Nehemiah. For the people had a mind to work. For the people had a mind to work. They understood that. Paul's word to the Corinthians was be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Your labor, knowing this, that your labor in the Lord, unlike any other kind of labor, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Sent into the world for a purpose, it's more than just me and Jesus. And friends, <clears throat> it's not sermonettes for Christian, for Christianettes in their bassinets. I don't know if you know what a bassinet is. A bassinet is a baby crib. Sometimes I almost think that's kind of the, what the church, some churches look like. You know, we, we give the shortest sermon possible because, well, people, you know, they, they've got lunch and they've got a busy life. And, <clears throat> and so people are uh, looking at their watches during the sermon and people get offended real easy. And we, <clears throat> you know, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to make things comfortable for them, don't we? So we want padded chairs. We want the temperature just right. We want the sound equipment perfect. We want the music perfect. We want the lighting just perfect. We want everything. Because isn't it about just making people comfortable? Isn't it? Not as I read the scriptures, friends. It's not about that. My guess is those 12, when Jesus sent them out with no with no bread, with no food, with no extra clothes. My guess is, it was yikes. This is not going to be easy, folks. How are we going to do this? My guess is, when he sent those 72 out, out like that, it was probably panic. I mean, it was way out of their comfort zone. It, it, it wasn't just about, well, we're here just to make you comfortable. We're here to coddle you. Because you're, you're our little Christianette in a bassinet. No, that's not, friends, that's not my vision for VEF. And you're going to pick this up. Every church does when they go through a transition from one pastor to the next. They over, quickly, they begin to see, oh, this new pastor, he's not anything like the old pastor. And, and you're going you're gonna to quickly see that. You're going to see that, you know, Pastor Tom, he, he's just not like Pastor John. <laughs> Hello, he's not. He's a different person. Yeah, we believe the same things. Yeah, we've got the similar training, all that kind of thing. But we're completely different personalities. We do things in different ways. And, and so all that kind of thing is there. And it's not about just making us comfortable it's about seeing the work of the kingdom and rolling up our sleeves. And friends, we've got that to do. There's going to be a vacancy. There's going to be a huge hole here in just a couple of weeks. Peter Park's gone. Pastor John's not going to be here. It's going to, like, it's going to be like, how are we going to do this? How are we possibly going to do well? Believe me, we're in the process of recruiting another pastor. It takes time, probably six months minimum, maybe even a year. Maybe in January or February, we may have our new pastor here. And so we'll be much more like normal. But in the meantime, friends, we got to step up to the plate. Uh, you, know, there, you folks can do a lot. And I know it means sweating bullets. I mean, we've got vacation Bible school coming up in August, and we've never done it like this before. We've never done an uh, uh, internet vacation Bible school. How are we going to do it? I mean, pray for Jim's. He's, <laughs> much of that is going to be on Jim's shoulder, too. But Dora and David and Olivia, we're all planning. We're planning, and there's tons of volunteers. You're stepping up to the plate. You see the kingdom work. It's not just about coming to church and sitting back in your chair and, oh, I'm comfortable. I, oh, it's, it's not lazy boy Christianity. It's not armchair Christianity. I don't want VEF to ever be like that, friends. It's a place where we can come and we can get pumped about God's kingdom. And it's like, 
Sign me up, man. This is exciting stuff. This is good. This is making a difference in the world. Send me out. Send me. I'll go out as one of the 72. And we have a message to proclaim. And Jesus sent them out to do healing. That's addressing suffering and casting out demons. That's identifying evil, calling evil for what it is. That's part of a huge part of the church. Is we we can discern what's right and what's wrong. We can discern what's going to build marriages and build people by the word of God. And and so we we aren't about this stuff. Okay, let's have the shortest sermon we can have. Let's learn the Bible, whatever it takes. We want to learn the Bible. It's not about having the shortest service, the the fewest songs as we can sing, the shortest sermon. In the book of Acts, at one time it points out, it speaks specifically that Paul prolonged his message beyond 30 minutes. No, that's not what it says. Beyond an hour? No, that's not what it says. It specifically says Paul prolonged his message until midnight. Until midnight. But you know what? He was talking to people who were incredibly hungry for the word, for the gospel message, and to learn know the Bible, to learn to know the Bible, so they can discern all these trends and messages and, and lifestyles and And all the the swirling around them in their day. They can discern what's true and right. Because they learned God's word. And had a hunger for working. Rolling up their sleeves. So it's not just sermonettes. For Christianettes. In their bassinets. Right? You with me? Okay, let's go on. So they went out means the 12, the 12. Jesus sent them out. So they went out. They obeyed, didn't they? (laughs) They obeyed. They could have disobeyed. They could have just said, well, wait a minute. We, We would rather just stay in our own homes. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to be laughed at. Uh, No. They went out and proclaimed that people should repent. Peter, the first day of the church, day of Pentecost, Acts 2. What was the main thing of Peter's message? Message, Repent and believe the gospel. A true biblical church today, a church that is rooted in historical Christianity and the Old and the New Testament, will not be shy about that, friends. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The message of the church, the Greek word for repent means to change your mind. We change our mind about who we are and what we have done. We agree with God about who we are and what we have done. So we go through a mind change here. We repent and believe. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. That was core teaching of their message. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Amazing. Amazing. What do we see there? Proclamation. We see that. Healing. Casting out demons. We see those three things there, right? You look in the book of Acts. You look what the first century church did. Guess what? They did three things. Three things. Started here, didn't it? Started all the way back to Jesus. When he sent the 12, when he sent the 72, and when 3,000 people were baptized and went out into the world. So it's about keeping the main thing the main thing. Much about the church is. That's going to be part of my concern as your senior pastor in the coming year. I'm going to always be taking the camera and adjusting the focus. When we're planning youth, 
We want to keep the main thing the main thing. When we're planning cell groups, we want to keep the main thing the main thing. When we're planning worship on Sunday morning, we want to keep the main thing the main thing. What is the main thing? Proclamation, according to his word, healing, addressing human needs, human suffering. It matters to us when some among the EF people are sick. We pray for the sick. We anoint with oil. We help them get medical care. They're suffering in any way, mental illness, They're suffering through loss of job. We address human needs. And three, cast out demons. What what do you mean, Curry? Isn't that kind of, woo? Well, don't miss that, friends. Don't miss that. You can't cast out a demon unless you recognize evil. Unless you recognize that there is a malevolent, highly intelligent, highly intelligent, force at work in this world that wants to destroy your life and others. You're up against a force. You're battling a force. Friends, in your, if, if you are married today, you're battling a force that wants to destroy your marriage and your home. If you're single today, you're, still, you're, you're not exempt. You're battling a force that wants to take you down that wants to speak little things in your ear that, that, will, that will destroy your life, that will distort your image of who you really are in God's sight. There is a malevolent force in this world that is pitting families against families, that is pitting countries against countries. I can see it in my own country. It's like I can't, I can't hardly recognize America now. Because we're so divided, we're polarized. And there are, whoa, those on the far right, they're they're ready to fight, friends. They're armed and ready to fight. Those are on the far left, they're armed and ready to fight. Do you think they're listening to one another? No, it's all about making their point known. And, you know, it, it used to be a country where the people in the center had the majority voice. And we were one of heart. But there, friends, there is a spirit at work in this world that is pitting people against one another, pitting nations against one another. And it's like two male dogs. Well, you ever seen two male dogs fight? <laughs> it's not pretty. It's not pretty. You just like, ah, people are like that. It's like we're destined, the world is destined to be fighting and fighting and fighting. And... We in the church, we in the church, we identify that force. We don't pretend it's not there. We give recognition to it and we resist it in the name of Jesus. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. He will flee from you. Be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil, Romans says. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That force that is wanting to take your life, that force that is at loose in the world, friends, that is destroying people's lives. We, the church of Jesus Christ, collectively, we are the only force in existence, the only organization in existence that we don't, we don't soft pedal this. We identify evil for what it is. We call out sin. We say this behavior will not get you what you want. It may be fun at the moment and and society may be telling you it's right, but it's not. And it will not promote life. It will not bring wholeness and, and make our society stronger. We identify it. We identify it and cast it out. Proclamation healing, addressing people's needs, and the casting out of demons, the identification, discernment of what is right and true and what is evil. Sent into the world for a purpose. We know why we exist. Christian, 
I hope you never say that. I don't know why I'm here. I'm collective, collectively a part of a body called the body of Christ. And that is one of the big reasons, if not the big reason, why I'm here. I'm a part of a family and we're moving forward seeking to transform the world. It's more than just me and Jesus. No, it's not sermonettes. I hope you don't hear that here. It's not little sermonettes for Christianettes and their bassinets. It's keeping the main thing the main thing. There's a lot of other things that are really good. I mean, yeah, we need chairs, right? So, yeah, well, that's a good thing, but it's not the main thing. We need a sound system. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's, it's not the main thing. We need a building. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But it's not the main thing. Keeping the main thing the main thing. Amen? You with me? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word to us today. Thank you for preserving the words of Jesus as given to us in Mark chapter 6 today. Thank you, Father, for speaking to our hearts as we're together in spirit, in our different homes and places here in Taiwan and around the world. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you. Amen.
And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.